You're listening to the SSPX Podcast, and welcome to Episode 16 of the Crisis in the Church series. We're happy to welcome back Father Dominique Bourmeau, the pastor of St. Vincent's in Kansas City, and the author of 100 Years of Modernism, to discuss the new theology that gripped the church in the mid-1900s. We'll look at this theology's champion, Henri de Lubac, and the outsized influence he played in moving the hierarchy to accept radical new teachings on the eve of the Second Vatican Council. If you're listening on the podcast, this episode is one best viewed on YouTube, as the corresponding text will be very helpful in your understanding. And if you'd like to learn more about this series we're doing on the crisis in the church, or go back and revisit our previous 15 episodes, or if you want to support this project, please visit sspxpodcast.com slash crisis. Now we'll turn to our conversation with Father Bormeau. Father, welcome back to the Crisis in the Church series, and it is a pleasure to have you again. Uh, Last time we were speaking about existentialism, we gave the background, the information about this existentialist philosophy, Uh, and today we're going to take it from learning about the philosophy of it to into a theological aspect and learning about the new theology that took root in the Catholic Church based on this existentialism. Is that correct? That's correct, exactly, yes. So those two segments here of the Crisis series are really touching on neo-modernism, which spans from maybe the, the end of the First World War to Vatican II, I would say. So it's a, it's a very broad spectrum right now as far as uh, time goes, but um, there is a certain unity about, about these people. Existentialism, so I put that, if you want, along also with uh, the personality of Blondel, and he came at the time of the, of the modernism condemned by President Tenth. And uh, I want to, to look at the person of Henri de Lubac in French. Henri de Lubac. I would say that, Andrew. Can you tell me the <laughs> English version? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think you said it just fine, brother, Henri de Lubac. Uh, <laughs> you tell me, it's it's a French name. <laughs> so anyway, this uh, typical um, leader, really, of what I call, what has been called la nouvelle théologie, the new theology of Henri de Lubac and his big circle, uh, is going to be our key here today for explaining the theology of neo-modernism. Okay. So this connection with Blondel, uh, with Blondel, they were close friends, and they really had some same ideas about the truth particularly. Blondel defined truth as the correspondence of the intellect, of the mind, with life. Not so much with the real thing out there, but with, with life. So truth varies, okay. evolves with life. They want also to reconcile their strange philosophy with faith, of course, but also there's a certain inferiority complex, let's say, between um, of the man, of the cloth, you know, priest or whatever, with the modern skeptical and subjectivist man of the 20th century, especially between the war, with uh, you know, the sense of absurd and uh, chaos and whatnot. So the purpose here is really to understand the concepts of neo-modernism, so we'll be looking at the position, the position of Dewey Bach and his group, especially, and the means for that is really his, um, he, the person himself and his writing. He's been a very extensive writer, um, and I think he was the main architect, I would say, of the new theology. And quite an important one, because along with Runner and Congar, I think Dullibach was the, the leading, uh, one of the leading theologians of the Council of Vatican II. And uh, seen as one of the greatest theologians of the 20th century, he was made a cardinal by his protege, um, Wojtyla, John Paul II. Okay. So we can go first of all, if you want, with the, uh, the question of the, the friends or the, uh, the school of the Lubac. Uh, so it's called the Fourvière School. Um, Fourvière is just a little suburb of, of Lyons, southern France. And Lubac, therefore, was a man who was very much interested in sacred scripture. So he taught scripture particularly, as well as the history of religions. So he was into quite a few things, really. And his big word was ressourcement, resourcing, going back to the sources, returning to the sources. And his, um, his team, uh, this team of the Fourier school, included the future cardinals, Danielou, 
one Baltazar also was going to be a, I think he was going to be cardinal when he died, I think, um, who translated the Liber back into German. Other people like theologians, Fessard and Bouillard, they will be, they will be later implicated in the uh, Roman condemnations uh, because of their you know, connection with Hegel or whatever, the modern philosophies. But this school of uh, Fourvier, the Lubac, if you want, created a vast network, network of uh, self-taught modernist thinkers who were pretty much the same content of anything Thomistic, self very clearly organized uh, scholasticism. It was too cold, too intellectualist, too rationalist. We must let okay. the fair. <laughs> So there's something okay. essentialist about it, as you can see. The right. Essentialist approach there. Um, some problem or some, you know, the, the school, I'm looking at the school here, the, the bigger picture, if you want, of um, the network of, um, of this school of the, of the Liberté. Um, the French Dominican provinces were in big trouble at that time. Paris and Twelfth was about to uh, throw them outside of the, the planet Earth and disperse, I guess, all these Dominican French troublemaker rebels <laughs> into the Portuguese province and the Spanish province, which are very conservative. And um, so the Pisces were about to, uh, to close the, the Dominican provinces. Likewise, the, the Jesuits were not in very good standing with, with Rome. There were certainly some signs of, of uh, modernism. And so this Jesuits, who were the superiors of Dolibac, he, he's a Jesuit himself, I forgot to say that, uh, in fact, pre pre preserved him, protected him, even if he was uh, under the close eyes of Rome and quite de facto condemned by, the, uh, by Rome. Then in 1946, with his book Supernatural, Supernatural uh, which, was, uh, which was not very good. So he was a, a prolific writer, tackle all the problems of modern time, communism, Nazism, atheism, and was always trying to win over the, the heretic, the atheist, to, to the, the Catholic camp. Mm. And the problem with him was that he did not have much of a philosophy of, of a strong philosophical background. So that's the man we're looking at right now in his, in his group. So when he was doing the, these writings and when he was you know, in his prime, uh, was was he specifically condemned by Pope Pius the Twelfth along with uh, along with some of the other French Dominicans and and some of the Jesuits or uh, was was he seen as an okay guy? Well, he was seen as an okay guy until uh, Surnaturel came up. Really, that's why just after the war uh, he became very prominent, and obviously he had a, a network of, of lots of friends at that time, as you can see. And, uh, and the Jesuits have protected him quite a bit, but it's really in 46 onwards that uh, things got very, very nasty. I see. So he, okay. was, he was not really, ex Conga was exiled to the Middle East. <laughs> and uh, right. not so with the Lubac. So he had to go to Paris, I think, for a little while, but went back, in fact, came back to uh, Lyon for the air very quickly. So he was not, he didn't have it too bad. <laughs> As right. that goes. And the condemnation okay. came really in 1950, only four years later, uh, with uh, Umani Generis. So we're going to see that, you see. So okay. he was protected by his friends, might say. So his okay. friends are um, he influenced Runner, the personalist Mounier, we might have spoken of him last time about existentialism. Taylor the Chardon, Taylor the Chardon was a very key person, of course, among the Jesuits. And Dolly Beck wrote a couple of books, I think, on him, or certainly defended him with his pen. And then the Dominicans, uh, Chenu and Conga, who were, as I said, ringleaders at Vatican II, believing in Conga. So he had high ranking protectors also with the French cardinals in, La La in Lyon, Lyons, and the future popes, uh, Voltina and Montini. So he, mm. he had good friends around. He had friends, he had friends among the Protestants. Uh, we've heard of Karl Bach, um, the Taizé movement, rather Roger Schulz and Marie Max Thurian. These are people who were, who were actually friendly with with Dolibach or vice versa. So he shared, I would say, the modernist and liberal ideas along with those movers and shakers of Vatican II that uh, would appear later on. So their ideas of returning to the sources 
Ressourcement was really a rallying cry for the new the zeitgeist, the spirit of the world, the, uh, the aggiornamento. That would be the like motive of Vatican II. So if the Libac therefore set up his Fovia school, uh, his circle, and was becoming very, very known and very prominent in these uh, high ranking people, he obviously had some enemies also. And I think he was his own enemy. Right. As a young dad, as a young priest or a young seminarian, he plunged himself into the forbidden books. They have the chapter, mm. of course, but also La Bertonnière, Blondel. Uh, La Bertonnière, for instance, rejected outside authority. It's called extreme cynicism. <laughs> we speak of that authority <laughs> on the road here. No outside authority to tell me what I have to believe, what I have to accept, or anything. Sounds okay. familiar to you? <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, it sounds fine. Let's let's go for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I knew you were deep down a real modernist, me think. <laughs> <laughs> so Blondel also rejected the supernatural. Uh, we speak of, of that when we speak of the, um, the new theology there. And uh, rejected the supernatural and rejected also a realistic approach to to apologetics. We're not, we cannot defend re, with, with rational arguments the essence of God, the faith, the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the um, what is the credibility. So, again, a brilliant mind, but turned upside down because it doesn't have a philosophy, really, it's philosophy background. And he was reading all these books and doing all this studying and thinking when he was very young. So his mind was very much bathed in these in these. Incorrect ideas, uh, Blondel, uh, Lobotny, Lobot, I can't say that name, uh, but uh, but yes, he's he's in in these ideas in these books, and this is going to form everything that he does uh, from here on out. Yes, and keep in mind he's protected and he's helped, and he has many friends who have got the same ideas, the same purpose in mind, who want to save the world uh, despite themselves. Uh, you know, Runner would be the same thing with his uh, anonymous Christian. Um, Taylor the child and says the world is heading towards the Omega point and the whole world is, is moving, is in progress towards the perfection. I don't know, the cosmic Christ nonsense. So that, those ideas are, are there. Dirty back, uh, picks up the ball and runs with it. That's right. It. So he was protected, but there, but at the time there, there were people who, there were uh, cardinals, priests, other theologians who were probably calling him out on this, right? Exactly. Yes. I mentioned here. Um, so Gangu Lagrange, we're going to speak of him in 46. So at the moment of supernatural, when he comes out of this book there, that will be very critical uh, and, um, and criticized strongly. Gangu Lagrange objects to that. Father Boyer, who was himself uh, the rector of the Gregorian or Jesuit University in Rome also, they accused him very clearly of falsifying the notion of truth. Now mm. you can play with certain ideas and certain things, but when you change the definition of truth, now we got a big problem in our hands, okay? Right. Carnival series speaks of his extensive work or so and calls them evasive. Because again, mm. they, they don't have any principle to back it up, principle, sound principle of philosophy. And then Pius XII um, calls upon the, the Cardinals of Lyons and says, I don't trust this guy. You know, he speaks of the duplicity of, of the Lubac. Quote, <laughs> an interesting quote here. The problem with him, the Lubac, is that you never know if what he says or writes corresponds to what he thinks. Wow. So that's the typical modernist for you who is not only a heretic, but also is doubled up with a, a, a traitor and just covers up his, uh, his tracks. Wow. Theo the Chardin, at least, was clear. You knew the guy was completely off the planet. I don't know which planet he lived in, and uh, but had no qualms about saying what he was saying very openly. Uh, but it's a bit different. Right, right. It's and it, it, you almost have more respect for someone for just being honest, even if they're way off the rails and and wrong. At least you can have some respect for them being honest and telling telling you what they think and what they believe, and you know it's true. But with with someone like this. Who Pius XII even says, you don't even know what he thinks is what he believes, How, you can't trust anything. Yeah, you cannot trust much of anything. You, you have to yeah. read between the lines what he's saying. And uh, so, what we're going to get into this, uh, this new theology, the Nouvelle Theology, which is okay. really neo modernism, you see that uh, you know, the, the undermining principles are, are a little off here. So, 
Uh, Buddha theology, again, really back is essentially, I would say, a, uh, an exeget. He's trying to study the scriptures and wrote extensively on the matter. So with that ressourcement, that return to the sources, what he's doing there is really to rediscover the mystical or the allegorical sense of the scriptures. Okay? So get away from the literal sense and try to understand you know, what's behind it, or the layers that you can superimpose to it. But this um, Christian sources, or he's the, um, the, 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 the principal or the leader of this uh, series, this long series of, of books on, on the pastoralistic fathers, uh, on the Christian sources, but he wrote really especially on origin, this 37 books on origin, so he's the golden child of Christian sources. St. Jerome, who is really the father of exegesis, has only four books. So, all in mm. all, uh, we, we see the trend here. And Origen, keep in mind, has very strange ideas, like the salvation of all men and all the demons at the end of the world, um, which is little odd to me. <laughs> right. So, when you're saying, Father, that he's returning to the sources to try and, 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 and study it, when you first started saying that, I was thinking, well, that sounds good. I mean, you go back to the original source and you read it and you study it. Uh, but what they're doing is they're pulling information out or coming up with information or uh, con uh, conclusions that really aren't there at, in the first place. Well, we're talking about the fathers of the church and some of them are Catholic and saints. Some of them are not. Origen is not a saint because he said many errors. We're just simply... Um, describing and, and commenting on the scripture, and that was at okay. the beginning of theology, so the, the definitions of the magisterium were not there yet. So basically what he's doing is a reduction to something very plain, simple. We want to go to, back to the gospel, which means forget about you know the philosophy, forget about the theology, forget about what the church teaches and de defines here, the condemnation of heresies. No, we can, we're just going to the fathers of the church. That's pretty nice and sweet, isn't it? Uh -huh. Okay. You see what that is getting at here? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, for instance, um, you know, the distinctions, Thomistic distinction about substance and accidents, we're going to be speaking about transubstantiation down the road, okay? We've got with, um, the Council of Trent against the Protestants. Well, the back says, or the, um, with, with his words of the law, he's saying, no, we don't want to have anything to do that. that. That's just rationalist. That's just too much you know, brain, brain stuff, which has nothing to do with really going back to the gospel. So we are throwing away uh, the baby along with the back water here. Mm -hmm. that, that's what he's doing with this Rosusamo thing. Uh, he says, for instance, really back here, it's a very serious deformation to seek to impose philosophical thesis, Thomistic thesis, of course, by authority as a so sort of a new credo. So away with philosophical uh, arguments, philosophical distinction, philosophical principles, which are simply realistic principles, and let's let's be free in uh, you know the gospel story. Well. And the apologetics therefore follows follows suite here. Uh, he, 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 there's a, a real scorn of the classical apologetics because um, the, the apologetics scientifically defines or, or establishes the fact of revelation, we should be able to say, yes, God has spoken at this particular moment, this particular time, in um, to, to human human life. The traditional apologetics also proves rationally God's existence, the martyrs of credibility. Uh, Dudebeck says, no, we don't want to have anything to do with that. Hmm. Um, He's against the, the faith or so, and uh, of the classical epoch. He conceives dogma as a revealed block without relation to man, as an object really regulated by an arbitrary divine decree. So the, uh, the, the, you know, the apologet, I guess, or the, uh, the, the Catholic Christian is, is mocking him, all right? He conceives dogma as something which is set up there and which is coming from, the, from God. Well, mm -hmm. it is. <laughs> That's the way it is. No, it doesn't accept that. You see, we, we want to make it up to God. I mean, we'll speak okay. Of Revelation is Christ alive for him. It's a bit different. Right. And so that scorn of, uh, of extrinsicism, uh, any superior authority which tells me what I have to do, what I have to accept, what I have to believe, I, I don't want anything of that, says to be back. 
the church must not be shut away into a juridical and official straight jacket. So another quote interesting from uh, Dudibach here, nothing is less in conformity with the truth than the extrinsicist, the outside doctrines which only maintain in the church a unity of constraint, only through visible transmission and visible authority. So we don't want to accept something which is imposed on us. Quote, they transform the obedience of the faith into a faith of pure obedience. A beautiful statement, and do it back and write. They transform right. obedience of the faith into a faith of pure obedience. But you see, the poison here is that we are rejecting a, a teaching authority of the church, basically. I don't know, I just see a problem there. Nice. Right. So, so his his big concern here to take his side, so to speak, for a minute is is that people are just blindly following these these arbitrary rules of of the church uh, that the church has has, has put forth. I, I guess he's sort of seeing the church the way that you and I would see someone who's a, a Jansenist, you know, uh, being being overly scrupulous, overly careful. Um, and he sees the entire Catholic Church as that way, and he says, "We need to get back to the to the very beginning. Let's go back. Let's reread Scripture, get some better understanding out of it, because the Church has just become too authoritarian." Too authoritarian, maybe too much. You know, the Talmud or the letter and not the spirit. I'm sure you uh-huh. be seeing that, 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 that vision of things. You know, the, get away from this Pharisaical straitjacket and, and be a little more free and, and, and just think your your think your faith, but along with Christ alive. So. Mm-hmm. There's an aspect here of relativism, which comes along in, um, in the next point here I want to talk about, revelation, the revelation with Christ. So the revelation with, uh, when we speak particularly of tradition, uh, of Dulibach, which is a key thing for him too. So what's revelation? For Dulibach, revelation is not so much a message, which we need to pass on, as is, okay. a, a <laughs> to somebody else. No, it's it's but the living Christ, the mystery of Christ. The revelation is the living Christ himself, rather than his message. So this explains why the deposit of the faith is never complete. Christ is God, is infinite, and therefore the revelation is never going to be finished. Uh, so yesterday, he says, here, we, another interesting quote of, um, of Dewey back on the revelation of Christ here, on the mystery of Christ. Yesterday, we were not at a pre- theological stage, neither will we tomorrow possess a complete theology of the church just to be repeated indefinitely. Indefinitely. So uh, the church moves, the faith revelation goes on and on, requires no more, you know, new 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 statements, new things. There's not such thing as a as a tradition which is not going to be a living tradition. And that's another of right. these aspects here. The tradition for him is, a, is, a, is, a, is not part of the revelation. Um, he's, he's against the idea of the two sources of revelation, which are the really traditional position, tradition and, and the scripture, the oral and the, uh, the written uh, revelation from God. He doesn't accept that as is. And that's crept into uh, David Verbo, the decree of Vatican II, a little bit too. But for him, tradition is a living message, and we're getting into historicism. History or tradition has to adapt to the era, to the moment. There's an existentialist right. aspect of things here, as you can see. Tradition. And we can see this connection, I'm sorry, Father, we can see this connection already starting to form here when we were learning about existentialism last week. This is, it's, there's never anything static. There's always something that's changing. The truth is never truth, it is always, will be truth, if I'm remembering kind of what you were saying yeah. Uh, properly. Yeah, exactly that. Exactly the, the idea of, of, of moving along and, and never really being exactly the same and contradiction won't be too much of a problem for, for the modernist. And then they uh-huh. say that Billy Back also has uh, touches that very strange line very quickly. Uh-huh. And tradition for him is not either conservation, not passing on unchangeable truths, Tradition is reference, creativity. Uh, it's quote, quote from him again, a concrete and living entity which updates itself according to the needs of each age. Okay. 
I need uh-huh. to be in union with our Lord, our Lord. Now, I need the Sacred Heart. Now, I need the Holy Eucharist. Okay, great, wonderful. But, uh, and it varies for him, and just, okay, we, we just lose one and we get something else. Very interesting. Progress, Very change, interesting. according to the needs. <clears throat> Right. The human, uh, the human, I guess, individual aspect is important here for him. Scripture, which is another part of the revelation, of course. Um, so he he is behind the movement of spiritual exegesis, the return to the sources, but also the return to the allegorical and scriptural and spiritual or mystical sense. But the spiritual exegesis for him is really an offspring of, uh, of subjectivism or really uh, of, of existentialism. It's superimposed to the literal sense. So, you know, the sacred scripture says one thing, okay, that means this, but I'm going to read it now and we read it. And how about if you don't read it and add up their own, their own ideas on, on the text, which is really growing and running by itself on it, on it, with its own legs now. And in his mind, uh, the sign of truth is when there is plenitude, totality, and when you can fit in more, 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 more people and more senses into into some some text. That's the sign that it is a true text. That is, you have the truth. Truth resides in the greater potential for inclusion. I don't know what that means, but it's a little strange. <laughs> The more potential you have for including different senses, different meanings, the more it is, it, it has the, um, the sign, if you want, the seal of truth to it. Right. Well, that makes all the sense in the world, right? <laughs> <laughs> I guess it does. <laughs> uh, I want to speak about the church and salvation because uh, Dullibach also has very strong ideas on the meditation on the church and whatnot and has uh, put in his impact and his seal also very much into the text of uh, Vatican II. For him, the church is mystery, and the church is the sacrament of Jesus Christ. And that will re- reappear in the decree of Vatican II, the Mengensium on the church. So the church is firstly mystery, and only secondarily an organization, an institution, a society. But it is mystery. Okay, now we're lost. We, we don't know where we're going. It's so far, but that's okay. <laughs> right. And then the church is sacrament. That is sign and cause of the unity of man. And as sign, the church is not so much the kingdom of God on earth as rather, it's not an ark or a ship where you can go into. It's rather a lighthouse. This lighthouse points to the direction where you want to go. It's a signpost. It's a pointing the way to heaven. It's not mm-hmm. God's kingdom on earth. It's not a place where you are, where you're saved or whatever. It's a, a signpost. It's 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 a it's a point. Uh, it's a it's a figure. I guess directed to to, to where you supposed, where heaven is. I guess. Here is a beautiful but rather vague statement, which was picked up by Pope Paul VI. Uh, and again, he can write. You know, he's a beautiful writer. The Church makes the Eucharist, and the Eucharist makes the Church. The church makes okay. the church. The makes the church. The church is the source, I guess, of the sacrament. The sacrament is the source of the church. Uh, the, is it part of what he says? You know, the church is sacrament of Christ. I don't know. Anyway, it's just interesting personality, I must say, despite his, um, his very relativist and uh, existentialist approach. So this is this is his I- idea of, of what the church looks like. Um, what is he saying then about? about salvation, I guess that's the next place to go. Correct, yes. Because the church is, for us, the the ark of salvation, the ship we have to board in order to get to heaven. For him, it's just, you know, it's, it's just a lighthouse. You don't dwell in a lighthouse. It's not a place where you stay. It's a place, it's a place which, which shows you the way to. So, salvation. Uh, Billy Beck has really we have a problem with the question of the supernatural, okay? His book, uh, which appeared in 1946, Supernatural, Supernatural sorry, uh, what was what the source of his condemnation and, and you know, raised a few eyebrows in, in Rome there. But he says, like Blondel, really, he's following Blondel there, the supernatural is absolutely impossible and absolutely necessary for men. Okay, it's, I know it sounds complicated, but basically he's saying, the supernatural is, we need the supernatural, otherwise we can't live, basically. And for Dolibach, God could not have created Adam and Eve without sanctifying grace. 
without elevating grace. Men have to have, men as men, has a strict right to beatific vision, to the beatific vision. That has to be grace, the uh, uh, ability, I guess, to, for the beatific vision has to be included in men, C or C, as we say in Spanish, you know, has to have it. So for him, um, anthropology means theology, or develops into theology. And Dullibach is the author of that very strange statement to Vatican II in Gaudium et Spes, which has been uh, commented so many times because it's so crazy, so strange. Quote, by revealing the Father, Christ completes the revelation of man to himself. Through Christ, the person of man is an adult. Man emerges definitively from the universe. Okay? Christ reveals wow. man to himself. That's wow. true. Yes, a bit strange statement here. But basically, our Lord Jesus Christ uh, has to become incarnate. I don't know the way I understand it. And through the incarnation, we we know ourselves, and we become Christ-like, or we become God-like, or we, we are saved through the, the salvation of Christ, or through the uh, incarnation of Christ. And Christ reveals me to myself. Interesting. Very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so salvation for the back basically is something which to me, it sounds like origin again, the uh, apocatastic, universal salvation for, for everyone. Uh, the grace of Christ, he says here, acts outside the visible church. Fair enough, you know, because people okay. will be saved and some, yeah. The famous axiom, outside the church, no salvation, for the church fathers was directed at those who fomented schism, rebellion, and betrayal. So yes, um, you know, maybe Hitler, maybe Luther, you know, the bad guys, uh, probably not today, but uh, uh, you know, these were, there was no salvation for these people. Everybody else, yeah, come on. <laughs> so he's, he's saying that the, the, the doctrine of no salvation outside the church uh, was used as, this was something that the early church fathers came up with, and they were using it as a tool to try to, you know, get some control over the, the bad guys who were causing problems within the church. It's not really a doctrine for everyone. Basically, we were limited to very few people. Yes, very uh-huh. few appointed individual, the, the nasty people. Yes, exactly. Okay. Uh, which is not a Catholic position, by the way. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, <laughs> Just to be clear. <laughs> see, the salvation of man also as a universal thing. Uh, it's the salvation of humanity as a collective whole here. It's a bit strange. Another interesting quote here. There must be a place where humanity, generation after generation, is gathered. It requires an eternal being, God, who totalizes it. Uh, so that's this optimistic view, if you want, that all men are going to be saved, somehow other by this, um, an extension of the communion of the saints, by being integral part of humanity, that uh, God, Christ, has to save us because he came, became a man himself. I mean, you see the, uh, again, the, uh, the position of Raleigh with the, um, before that again, the uh, anonymous Christian, even if you are atheist and you deny God, you have to be saved because you, you, you have accepted Christ in your, by, by being a man. Mm-hmm. Right. Just by that one act, you're saved. Yes. Now, I've convinced you now, you, you are a, a modernist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I have some more work to do, Father. <laughs> So obviously, you can imagine these uh, these statements here were pretty shocking in the 40s and the 50s. Yeah. And um, you know, for instance, the that's the fact of submitting to an authority transformed the obedience of the faith into a faith of pure obedience. That's, uh, this seems very uh, bodiless, really. Already, the supernatural, absolutely impossible and absolutely necessary for man. Revelation is the living Christ himself, rather than a message of Christ. Uh, the church is mystery and sacrament of Jesus Christ, rather than the kingdom of God on earth. The universal salvation for, universal salvation for, for new man. Uh, all this strand, you know, sounds a bit strange and not going to be accepted very well by, um, by the Roman authority. So yeah. Gabriel Lagrange came up with a very strong article, which was a bombshell, really, in, uh, in the theological world at the time. Uh, and the title is The New Theology, Where Is It Taking Us? Here's an interesting quote here from, from uh, the, the conclusion of Gabriel Lagrange, who was a, a Roman Dominican, very strong, and had the support of the Pope. Right. Well, 
these writers, so we're talking about the new theology, the circle of Fourier and um, the new theology, these writers have not abandoned the doctrine of St. Thomas. They have never really understood it. How could such a manner of teaching form anything but skeptics? Where is the new theology taking us? Where but down the path of skepticism, fantasy, and heresy? Hence, the condemnation a few years later, 1950, so four years later, 2012, came up with the uh, encyclical Humani Generis, so the general of, uh, of the human race. And he felt himself it was urgently needed, really, to uh, come up with it. If timely action had not been taken, stone would not have been left upon stone. I hear around me reformers who want to dismantle the Holy Sanctuary, destroy the universal flame of the Church, discard all the adornments of the Church, and smite her with remorse for the past. So, by the 12th, in his condemnation, in his statement here, he's simply stressing that, okay, uh, there is a supreme authority in the Church, teaching Church, because he had no chance, sole guard of the deposit of the faith, and she has the right to impose uh, statements and formulate, uh, even if people don't accept it. The dogma, the dogma doesn't have to adapt to the modern text. The dogma is, is perennial. So he's obviously targeting here the um, new theology, and, and all, all these, I think, correspond also to the um, back here. Some some. He doesn't mention them. I think it's a mistake on the part of the Pope here to not have mentioned you know, the uh, anathema sit bias, anathema sit Luther, anathema right. sit Clavin. <laughs> right. And it's part of the, uh, the flaws, I think, of women in there. Um, Cardinal Bea was its confessor, asked him, you know, can you chop it down, please, or whatever. So some, he says, some destroy the gratuity of the supernatural order, since God, they say, cannot create intellectual beings, men, or angels, without ordering and calling them to the beatific vision. So supernatural is something natural to us. That has to be given us. Some even say that the doctrine of transubstantiation, based on an antiquated philosophical notion of substance should be so modified that the real presence of Christ in the Holy Eucharist be reduced to a kind of symbolism. Is Christ really present there? I don't know. Okay. Uh, some say, getting back to the question of the mystical body, that they are not bound by the doctrines which teaches that the mystical body of Christ and the Roman Church are one and the same thing. Some reduce to a meaningless formula, the necessity of belonging to the true church in order to gain eternal salvation. Okay? I don't have to belong to the Catholic Church to be saved, basically. You know, be a good Buddhist, be a good Muslim, be a good Jew, Jew, Jewish person, and you'll be fine, you'll be saved. Others belittle the reasonable character of the credibility of Christian faith. The basic message, of course, of humanity generis is simple. The magisterium is the guardian of and interpreter of divine revelation, of the faith and of dogma. You cannot reduce Christianity to a personal human changing experience. So, okay. so humanity generis was, was entirely a repudiation. It was entirely a, a condemnation of all of these new ideas. And it was, it was Lubaku was basically the, the ringleader, or was he just the more accomplished writer out of, out of this group? I do think he was one of the ring leaders because of okay. it, um, the religion is attacks tell, tell how the children attacks these philosophies, especially Blondel, existentialism and whatnot, and attacks those the holders of these positions that the back here is really foremost in my in my book here. Right. And and we may be getting into this in another in another episode later, but what was the reaction of the new theologians, you know, Lubach, etc., when Humanity Generis came out? Yeah, he himself realized that, okay, lightning has struck Fourier, that's what he said. And Taylor the Chauvin said, um, what was very nasty, actually, when uh, when he heard about Humanity Generis, for an encyclical which calls itself, you know, to be so Catholic, so open to the whole world, it looks pretty narrow-minded to me. There's a certain ma- masochism of, of, the, of the church today, and it just mocks it totally. That's very funny, the way he comes out with it, actually. Wow. So, so they don't they don't take it to heart at all. They are they're just going. Oh well, this is just the the Pope. He's he's attack, attacking us. Poor us. We are. Come on. 
Exactly. Wow. Yes. I mean, they know they have been targeted. They have known to be under attack. So the new, uh, the new back is just you know cooling off a little bit. Uh, his superiors are going to protect him no matter what until the challenge is gone by that time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And keep in mind that in 1958, Lulubak and his friends were still held in his honor when Pachini died in 1958. In 1962, or even, even maybe 61, Archbishop Raphael was talking to Cardinal Taviani, a good friend of his, and he asked, you know, why are these men suspect of modernism allowed at the council as the penalty of the Pope, Congar and Lulubak especially? And uh, Otaviani told him, the boss wants it. <laughs> <laughs> the boss wants it. Wow. So Pope wow. Benedict appears in 1950, Vatican II Council ends in 1965, 15 years later. The new theology, solemnly censured, condemned by Pius XII, had become the official church theology. Never before the Catholic Church history uh, had seen a dogmatic and encyclical so quickly denied, disavowed, and completely disavowed by the very men which it had condemned. That's interesting. That's amazing. Yeah. So, so this this the Humana Generis is out in 1950, and and even faster than that. I mean, 1962 between 1962 and 1958. 1958. These these men are still in dishonor. Pius XII dies. 1962. You have the beginnings. You know, the preparatory period of the council, which we'll look at here in the next episode. And uh, this is this is already back in the church. Right. The Zeitgeist wow. was there. The, the the poison was everywhere, and was um, and the Pope, the good Pope John Paul John Twenty Third, uh, was accepting those people in, wanted them in. Yeah. Okay. So he was ready for the novelty the adjournment. Yes. Yeah. Wow, that is amazing. Uh, not in a good way. I'm I'm not a modernist. I promise you, Father. No matter how many times you say it, I'm not a modernist. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Andrew. Wow. Well, that was fascinating. Thank you very much, Father. I appreciate it, and uh, I look forward to talking with you again here in another episode soon. Thank you. God bless. All right. Very good. Thank you. Thank you for listening to and watching episode 16 of our Crisis in the Church series here on the SSPX podcast. In episode 17, we're going to have Father Jonathan Loop return as a guest as we will look at the preparatory period of the Catholic Church just before the Second Vatican Council what led up to the council, what was happening in the Rhineland, and who was gaining influence. If you have a question on the topic of the crisis, please feel free to ask it at sspxpodcast.com slash crisis. Please share this episode with someone who you might think would enjoy it. And if they don't know what a podcast is, please show them so that they can take advantage of all our episodes. And if you have the ability to set up a monthly recurring donation of 5 or 10 or $20 on sspxpodcast.com, it would help us immensely to complete this Crisis in the Church project. Until next week, thank you for listening, and God bless you.